Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and one of the things we enjoy doing most on L'Chaim is introducing you to some of the truly outstanding and remarkable men and women who are making unique contributions to Jewish life and to the Jewish people. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I'd like to play for you a conversation I had with a remarkable man who's been serving the Jewish people for decades. First, as an officer in the elite Golani Brigade, then in Israeli government, serving as secretary for two prime ministers, Ariel Sharon and Ehud Omert, and now who serves as the president and CEO of Israel Bonds. His name is Israel Maimon, who spoke to me from his Manhattan apartment during COVID-19, I being in my home as well. And as you'll see, Israel Maimon has a unique insight into much of what's confronting the state of Israel now and over the past 40 years. And I think you're going to find him an absolutely lovely and wonderful human being. On L'Chaim, here is my meeting with Israel Maimon. By the way, during this pandemic, how are you and your family doing? Well, actually, I'm three and a half years in New York, and my I have uh, three kids in Israel. So I'm when, when Netanyahu asked to celebrate only with the nuclear family, I'm the most nuclear you can think of. I, I celebrated with myself here in the apartment. Uh, however, uh, it was good to speak with my kids. They live in uh, Modi'in in Israel, and thank God all my family is good. That is wonderful. What are your children's names? Jonathan, my firstborn that, by the way, served in the same unit in, like I am, Golani. Oh, how, proud, I have, how proud that must have made you, Israel. Yes, yes, it was. It, I, I haven't spent even a word with him before he joined the army, but probably we, we leave some impact as parents. So I, I was really proud of him, and the, uh, he served Israel in a, a significant way. And I have two great, amazing daughters. One is Ori, which in Hebrew is my light. And the other one is Ela, not on the name of the goddess, but on the name of the tree, Ela. And where are they in life? They live near, they live in Modi'in. Ori is 18 years old and Ela is 13. Okay. Mazel tov to you on three children. By the way, we should know something about your background. You were born where, Israel? So I was born in Tel Aviv, in the south side of Tel Aviv, and, but most of my life I grew up in Ramat Gan. Um, my parents are the ordinary, amazing, great story of the Jewish people that came from all over the world. So my father immigrated to Israel after it was established from Tunisia, and my mother immigrated as a, a young uh, kid from Iraq. And they met in Tel Aviv. Wonderful. And what are their names? My father, bless his memory, his name is Reuven, Robert, and my mother's name is Pnina. Okay. Which is in, uh, in Hebrew, it's Pearl. Yes. And as you were growing up, what kind of Jewish background or Jewish home did you have? So I would say that we were Masorti. It was a house that kept uh, kosher at home, different sinks for different sinks to be used to uh, milk, dairy, and different sinks for the meat and the chicken. Um, we kept uh, kosher. Uh, we went to the synagogue uh, in good times and uh, in the holidays. But I wouldn't say that we're, we were religious. However, we were very Masorti. Um, my, my family was very close with my siblings. We were all together. And uh, an ordinary 
great Israeli family. Yes, you do understand Israel and you've spent time with American Jews. What is for you Masorti, which means traditional. So you're, what you mean is you're not Dati, you are not Orthodox, you were not uh, observant in the, in the sense of Shomer Mitzvot, but the Jewishness you had in your home growing up is something that many American Jews do not have. Yes, so I have to tell you that, first of all, I was amazed, and this is something that is so unique for Israelis coming and, and find about the diaspora. We don't know much and we don't know enough and we're not connected enough to see how rich the life here in the, in the States of the Jewish communities are. Yes. Uh, how we, our Jewish communities are celebrating holidays, Shabbat dinner. Um, so for me, as an Israel Bonds leader now, I see my role as a bridge, not from Israel to United States or the diaspora, but, but rather from, from diaspora to the Israelis to explain about the richness of the Jewish communities, by the way, not only in USA, but also in Mexico and Brazil. That is um, wonder. yeah. So, it, and it is so heartwarming for me to be uh, participating uh, when people are inviting me to Shabbat dinner or to the different synagogues. Um, it, it, it is something so unfortunately remote from what Israelis knows, Israel, the regular Israeli knows about uh, Jewish life. And by the way, if we speak about the different streams in Judaism and in the United States, we don't know enough what is Reform, what is Orthodox, what is ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox. And again, I see it as a mission to myself to serve as a bridge and to bring this, as I said, amazing richness that exists. That is wonderful to hear. Um, and before we continue with your own background, why do you think it is that there is this disconnect of understanding among Israelis for what diaspora Jewry is in general, but more specifically, you've also, I'm sure, seen the extent to which within the Jewish world here in America, there's an enormous commitment enthusiastic commitment to the state of Israel. It is not across the board, but where it exists in the American Jewish community, it is strong, it is loyal, and it loves the state of Israel. I constantly run into Israelis who never knew that and are sort of surprised by that. How, how is that possible that after all these years, there is this disconnect? Well, why it exists, there are many, many social reasons. I think that, for instance, let's take, let's take the reform movement just as one example, or the, the conservatives. When you, and I'm sorry for going to this direction because I was cabinet secretary, and when I was cabinet secretary, so in Israel, there are parties, political parties, that represent either the ultra-Orthodox or the Orthodox. We don't, so, so not only we're familiar with those communities in Israel, we are not familiar whatsoever with the conservative movement and the reform movement that doesn't have a political representation, I would say, in Israel. And their communities if, in Israel, even though they exist, they don't, you, they are less involved in the regular Jewish life. So I'm not, of course, blaming but this is, the, this is the fact that we know less about those good, great two streams in the Jewish life here. And I, I fully agree with you. Yeah, go ahead. You're speaking specifically about Jewish pluralism here in America. And that doesn't surprise me that Israelis really don't understand what Jewish pluralism is and what is necessary for Jews in America or the diaspora. Simply, it's not the same as what is Jewishly necessary for people who grow up Ba'aretz in the state of Israel. I'm asking a slightly different question. I hope you have found there is enthusiasm, love, passion for the state of Israel and within American Jewry, an enormous desire to help both financially, 
and in terms of visiting and in terms of any politically, any way in which American Jews can somehow contribute. And many, many American Jews feel profoundly connected to the state of Israel and feel it is not a different country. It's in some way because of our being one large international family. It's also part of who we are and it's ours in some way. I want you to speak to the fact, and you may disagree with me, I think many, many Israelis do not appreciate how American Jews are enthusiastically supportive of Israel here in America. First of all, I totally agree with you about the treasure that exists here, whether it's uh, the different streams or whoever. They are, we, we, I will say we because I'm part of the Jewish community now, but the Jewish community in the diaspora and United States is so committed. And I find it every day in every aspect, whether it's when I'm receiving letters of support from liberal Jews or whether from reformed Jews or whether their political views are democratic views. I found from the spectrum, from the left to the right, from secular to religious, amazing commitment to the state of Israel, not because they are there, exactly to your point, it's because it's ours. Yes. And they but, care because they are ours. Okay. And by the way, sometimes they are criticizing because yes. they, they think it's ours. Yes. And, to your point, and to your point, I agree that we Israelis don't know that while someone can have a very lefty, liberal, democratic views personally, he can love the state of Israel as much as he loved the United States. And I, I said, as an Israel bonds leader now, I, I will share with you and, and, and your followers that, that they are not happy all the time, the Israel bond supporters here in the state, they're not supporting all the time certain decision of the government or the prime minister. So I'm getting sometimes not a flood, but letters that are saying, hey, we, um, it's very hard for us to continue supporting Israel bonds because it's the bonds of the government, because of the, of the decision of the government. However, Israel is so important to us that we are continuing. But we want to let you know, and please convey the message, that we are not supporting those decisions. And Israelis doesn't understand that this is a love without condition. Yes. Yes, you say it so beautifully. Okay, pick up your own story. After high yeah. school, you go into the IDF, and you end up at some point in the Golani Brigade. How does that happen? Oh, <laughs> so it's a very simple story. In Israel, is, uh, in Israel, when you are 17, 18, you start debating which unit you are going to join and in our neighborhood there was a guy that i love two two years uh, older than i am that went to golani and he spoke about the brotherhood of the the familyhood brotherhood that exists in the golani brigade and uh, another guy was uh, um the uh, brother of my good friend that was like an idol to me that joined the Golani Brigade, became an officer. And both of them spoke so highly about this unit, but not only about it's a combat unit, but, and especially, but also about the, the brotherhood and familyhood of the simple pe people that serves in that unit. Did you find that to be true for yourself? Uh, totally, 110% true. And this is remarkable. I, my, my best friends are from that time. It's the ordinary people that are coming from the neighborhoods, the small towns, the villages, the farmers. It's not what you uh, accept, expect as the, um, I would say, the high society kind of uh, guys. It's, uh, and it, it, and, and it, it, for me, it was great to serve together shoulder to shoulder with them. Okay. What year did you enter? the Golani Brigade? 
I joined the army in 1984. It was uh, two, and finished uh, at 88. So I served um, two years as a regular soldier, a uh, small uh, uh, squad commander, but I wanted very much to be an officer. So I joined the officer force and then I was a platoon commander and a company commander. And I uh, finished my service after four years. Okay. At date 1988. Okay. You know the IDF intimately. Every now and then, here in America, in Europe, there is criticism of the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, for doing things that are either brutalizing Palestinians or humiliating Palestinians or that in some way crosses a moral line. When you hear that, Israel, what do you say to yourself and what would you like our audience to know? What would you like the world to know about the ethic of the Israeli army, the Golani Brigade, and the men and women you served next to, and then your children as well. From your perspective, what's the real, what's the MS, the truth about who in the world the Israeli soldier is? I want to be very clear and, uh, and, and there is not even a slight hesitation in what I'm going to say because I saw it through four years that I served and I saw it later on when I was cabinet secretary and I know how, uh, what are the instructions that were given to the army. And I saw it also through the service of my son. The, uh, when you start your service in IDF, you know from the first beginning that you possess a power but you need to exercise this power under strict rules that you should use your power just when you have a risk to your life or when there or whether there is the risk to the to the citizens of Israel or to the state of Israel only and only for that and i'm telling you it's it's about education it's about instruction it's about discipline it's about commanding and this is going from the, from the squad commander up to the uh, chief of staff. And I, I will tell you that, again, at the stage where I am, that I'm familiar with what's happening also in other armies and the rules and education, I don't know of any other army in the world, whether it's in European army, that is not facing usually risks, but in the United States as well. I don't know of an army that puts so much energy, resources, education about preventing of harming uninvolved citizens. Now, of course, when you take action, there are mistakes, but mistakes are not the rule. And the mistakes, what is important with Israel is a democracy that mistakes or misconduct are investigated and in some of the cases people the soldiers are punished but i would say that in general and more than in general israel is putting so much in order to exercise its authority and power in preventing the risk to the state of israel and by the way it's doing it while we are a state that constantly is on the risks from war or from terror which are two different things. But while during the last 71, 72 years, we are in facing such risks, we are demonstrating the most highest value, value when you can speak about how army is exercising this power. Thank you for that. I saw in your biography, I believe I saw, that in 2007, you were involved in taking out the Syrian nuclear reactor. Do I have it right? Yes. Um, and you know, all of us first watched when Menachem Begin took out the Iraqi reactor. And there was criticism of him then. And then in retrospect, the world was very happy that Israel and Begin took that move. 
do you remember whatever, uh, how shall I say, what kind of debate, what kind of worry was there when you were part of that same type of action in Syria at a time when, you know, the world was still a very complicated place in terms of relationships in the Middle East. But take one moment and try to bring us back there and just describe how the action evolved, how you felt about it, and how you feel it went in the end. So you started with begging, and correctly, but this is the first thing I want to touch. The nuclear reactor in Iraq was hundreds of kilometers or miles away from the Israeli border. However, it possesses risk. The Syrian nuclear reactor was, I would say, dozens of kilometers or miles from the Israeli border. The, the concern was huge because, first of all, it's Syria, not Iraq, that doesn't have a mess today. But it's Syria, which possesses a serious threat. Syria that is sitting on the Kinneret, on the Sea of Galilee. Syria that got the know-how, resources from North Korea, which is something that we need to understand as well. And another thing <clears throat> is that the concern is that if you will not do something, you are going to face this threat sitting on your border and once you have such a threat, you are limited in what you can do in order to protect yourself. So there was a real serious concern. But immediately, and by the way, there was a great cooperation between the Israeli administration that time, Ehud Olmert, Ehud first Amir Peretz, and Ehud Barak, Tipi Livni, and the USA administration. Then the president was uh, President George W. Bush, that I had the privilege to meet him like 13 times with Ariel Sharon and with Ehud Olmert. But there was a great cooperation between the two administrations. The concern was that the nuclear reactor is in the process of being built. It's not warmed. It means that it's not, um, um, still doesn't have the radiology material to the point that they can uh, manufacture a bomb. But you don't want to have it arriving to this point because if you then bomb it, you might pollute all the Euphorite Valley. It's a major, major river in Syria. And it can cause a huge pollution for the Syrian civilians. And later on, this river uh, goes along all the way to the Kinneret, to the Sea of Galilee. So there was a concern about the threat itself. And if we are not taking care of that at that time, we will not be able to take care of it because it's going to be hot, meaning that there is going to be a radioactive materials. It was very intensive days, very short time, because the experts said that it is on the verge of becoming hot. There were many discussions with the American administration. First, because of many reasons, Israel wanted America to deal with that because it, at that point we thought that it reduces the threat of having a full-scale war between us and the Syria. But eventually, George W. Bush, because of uh, internal reasons, uh, decided that um, his, he, his suggestion was that he will deal with that diplomatically with Condoleezza Rice. And I will never forget the call between Ehud Olmert and President Bush. When, when, when Ehud Olmert heard that he, uh, Bush and his uh, administration wanted to solve it dip diplomatically, he said, with all due respect, Mr. President, don't send Condoleezza Rice because diplomatic will hold it and the, the reactor will become warm. So please don't do it. This is, we are speaking about the security of Israel 
And if you are not going to deal with that, we are going to deal with that. And eventually, after a short time, a uh, few F-16 bomb it. Yes. It was a very successful operation. And as I remember, and I may not be remembering totally correctly, there was very little blowback afterward. I don't remember Syria taking any drastic steps against Israel, nor do I remember the world being terribly critical. Am I remembering correctly? You remember very much correctly. The notion was that, first of all, we are not revealing anything that we know that there is a nuclear reactor. And we wanted to do that in order for Assad not to do any move that will block us from dealing with that. But the old strategy, and this is something that I was um, responsible of, is to create the communication plan. First of all, that it will not leak. And second, prepare a communication plan that if we are bombing it, how we are making sure that we are not bragging, how we are not taking credit about the bombing, because we knew that because it was so top secret in Syria, not a lot of people knew in Syria, even the chief of the army, the chief, the chief of the army of the Syrian army didn't know about it. There was a special, special commander for that. And we thought that if he hide it, because it was North Korea, if we would have bombed it, the intelligence said we might be able to give Assad, the president, uh, um, an excuse to contain it because it's a great humiliation. He didn't want to be uh, in trouble because North Korea cooperation and other stuff. So the whole communication plan was designed in order for him to contain it. This is from the, this perspective. And immediately after the bombing, there was a major effort of the diplomacy that we updated the European countries and other countries in, in, and explained them. I prepared a very uh, elaborated uh, file that proved without any question what Syria was building. Um, we had, if you recall, the Mossad agency put the hand, put its hand on files from a computer of the scientist, a Syrian scientist that was in charge of the atomic um, plan, the project. And the Mossad uh, put his hand on, it's an amazing story, and took from that computer, by the way, without him knowing it was important, we downloaded pictures from this Syrian uh, reactor. And this eventually enabled us to explain to the whole world what Israel was doing, even though publicly we didn't take credit, so Assad could contain it. I understand. I, it, was, it was a brilliant operation, and call it a vote to you is for whatever part you played it in. Our audience should understand, by the way, um, I am sensitive to the fact that you are the running Israel Bonds. You're president and CEO of Israel Bonds. I didn't bring you on to ask you to talk about the current election. I didn't ask you to come out and talk about current affairs in general. I didn't, I'm not going to ask you what any question having to do with Israel and the American administration now. I don't think that's fair to you. So I've talked to you so far about who you are, what you've done, your past. And we spoke a little bit about Israel and American Jewry. But there is one area that is contemporary, which is non-political, that I do want to hear you speak to, and it, especially because of your experience taking out the, uh, the Syrian nuclear reactor. And that has to do with Iran. And I want to know the extent to which you feel Iran does pose a real threat to Israel, uh, Israel and the world. Is it overblown? when we hear it discussed, and if it is not overblown, what is realistic from your perspective in terms of both Israel, America, and for that matter, the world, dealing with the potential of a nuclear Iran? 
So I, I will answer in a second. But Mark, you can ask me a, a, everything you like. Of course, as a guest in the United States, I will not criticize our uh, administration or, or I will not praise it on how they are dealing now with the virus uh, about politics in Israel. I'm, I'm, I consider myself an expert, so I can give assessment. But to your question, so feel free. And when I, want, I, when I would like to not answer in a political way, I will, I will do so. Fair enough. With regard to with regard to Iran, first of all, sometimes people doesn't want to listen. And when an Iranian leader is saying, I want to destroy the state of Israel, I want that people will listen. I want people not to ignore it, not to say, oh, he's only threatening. There were so many times during the history whether it's about Jewish people or non-Jewish people, that people threat, leaders threat, and we didn't listen. And I'm not just jumping immediately to the Nazi regime, which is, you know, everyone is taking it to, the, to that point. No, but leaders that are threatening in destroying a country and are doing day to day, the, the audience needs to understand, Iran is not involved only through Hezbollah. Iran is now involved in terrorist acts, in trying to make regimes fall and to take full control of those regimes in Yemen, in Africa, in many states, in Lebanon, they already has it, and of course in Syria. So when you have a leader that is having an intention, second, having the tools, and the tools is everything that I said, and wants to have the tool that is called a nuclear bomb, we have to listen and not ignore and not say, oh, they are not meaning it. So this is how I see it. However, the solution, of course, it's very complicated and all the world is dealing with that. I think that the nuclear project of Iran is totally different than one reactor in Syria, one reactor in Iraq. Sure. It's a much more complex situation. It's very far. It's not Iraq. It's not Syria. It's far. It's spread over Iran, the different components of the project. And think the strategy of, first of all, to explain the world that it is not, it is not the problem only of the state of Israel, but of the free world. How explain it? Because of seeing what Iran doing, not vis-a-vis -vis Israel, but vis-a-vis -vis the other places. Yes. So first of all, to understand that it's not only Israel problem. Mm -hmm. And second, there was a great situation that proved it, uh, that proved it as an evidence of the sanctions. And I think beside what you need to prepare as the last, I would say, option of strikes, you have to use every mean, every mean. And one of the best means are the sanctions that I believe prove themselves, prove themselves. I, I believe that those sanctions, like it worked in other places, should bring the results if you're doing it consistently and for a long time and not just giving up because suddenly they are becoming nice and speaking nicely. And you should hear them all the time. They didn't change their tone. They didn't change the messaging. Sometimes the president of Iran is speaking one way while the foreign affairs minister is speaking differently. But they are having the same message. And this is how I see um, the Iran threat. I will tell you one last thing that is a little bit connected. The Syrian, the Syrian nuclear reactor was bombed in 2007. Let, now let's take the piece of history. In 2000, 2000 Prime Minister Barak wanted to negotiate peace with Assad, President Assad, the father. Mm -hmm. And then Assad died. His son came. His son came, a very 
stable leader in Syria, try to possess a nuclear reactor. We bomb it. Then Syria is going through this nightmare of the civil war. ISIS is trying to get control of all over Syria, actually controlled 85% of Syria. And then the Russians are coming in. What I'm trying to say is, look how unstable this situation is. And God forbid, if Israel didn't bomb the nuclear reactor, the place where the reactor was built in Syria was actually under the um, authority of ISIS. Think, think about a nuclear bomb in the hands of ISIS. Put aside if they have the capability to launch it or not launch it, just to think about ha them having a nuclear uh, bomb in their hands. Yeah. So what I'm so people should understand it's not about Israel. The threat of ISIS, unfortunately, many were killed by ISIS. It, one not Israeli was killed by ISIS. Mm -hmm. It's a problem of the free world. And I would say the same with regard to Iran. People, okay. leaders, European leaders, even here in the States, are ignoring the fact that it's not only our problem in Israel, but it's a problem of the free democratic world. I understand. So, were you supportive of the Iran nuclear deal of the Obama administration? And were you, how did you feel when the Trump administration in some way not withdrew from that, from that deal? What's your sense? I, I, I would say, I would say one thing. I thought that the, the time, the time that the deal came was the wrong time. It was the wrong time because I, I'm not getting to whether you are dealing in businesses or not, negotiating business or not. But the time that the deal came was at the time that the sanctions showed that it's working. The fact that the Iranians were agreeing to sit to the table proved after many years that they didn't want to be there, they, it proved that they went, came to the table because of the pressure they felt. And my biggest uh, criticism, I would say, about the deal, put aside its content, because its content has some other problems that it's too complicated to go into. One of the major problems that I had was the timing. The time room was at the time that the sanctions were really, really start paying the fruits. I and we should have continued that and not sit with them to the deal that eventually brought the deal as it was with all its problems. So with regard to what Trump administration did, I think that the, the notion, the understanding that sanction eventually will prove itself and sanction, it's a good, I would say, option, much better than using force because the force to use force is not a good option. Okay, not but, a good okay, but Israel, the Iran deal of the Obama administration went hand in hand with lifting the sanctions. So in essence, you're saying that while there may have been some good aspects to it, I don't know if you feel, by the way, there are many American Jews who felt that the deal did not take the bomb off the table. It simply extended it's developed exactly. out 10 years. And so many of us were very, very, we did not support it for that reason. It, I, you know, many of us did not feel it did what it was meant to do, meaning prevent Iran from ever developing a nuclear weapon. So, but in addition to that, it lifted sanctions. And then America brought, I don't know, released whether it's a billion, who, I don't know exact the number. The media throws all kinds of numbers uh, around. But a great deal of cash was flown from America to Iran. In theory, it was Iran's own money. But it was infusing Iran's government, the Ayatollah, etc., with a certain degree of capital that could be used and not to build infrastructure 
and to feed hungry Iranians, but to feed the international terrorism that Iran was sponsoring. So what was your sense of it from that perspective? Mark, I totally agree with your, anal an your analysis. My problem is that first, and I spoke about the, the sanctions, it, it, instead of keeping them, lifted them, and a lot of cash was, and this cash, by the way, you can say it, it's indirect, but this cash you can find today in Africa, in Yemen, and in other places that are hitting, by the way, U.S. forces that are spread all over the Mediterranean and Africa. So, first of all, the sanctions were lifted, money was poured, and to you are totally right that the one big problem of this deal is that it didn't put away the project. It didn't eliminate it too, totally. It's only postponed it. I don't understand if what the, the how come you are ending a deal, you are signing the deal, that you will have to deal with that 10 years from now. Now, we just spoke about how fragile this place is with two, from 2000 up to now, 2021, 20, I'm sorry, 20 years. It's, it's a drop when you speak about history. And this is a very short-seeing short yeah. uh, uh, thinking. So, did the Trump administration do the right thing by pulling out of the deal? I, I think it was right. I think it was right. And putting on the table again the sanctions with, 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 with full scale was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. If necessary, does Israel have the military capacity to take out the Iranian nuclear project? As I said, it is so complex. It, it's right. so uh, it is. Different. <laughs> it's different. However, however, I served uh, two prime ministers, uh, Ariel Sharon and Ehud Olmert. And when I was the cabinet secretary, Bibi Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu was the prince in this leading Israel uh, remarkably uh, for the last uh, uh, more than 10 years. And I, I believe that when they are saying, and they said it again and again and again, that if, if as a large resort, Israel will have to face itself, it will know how to, I'm sorry, to defend itself, it will know how to defend itself by itself. There was a very, uh, you know, I worked with Ariel Sharon three years until he got, unfortunately, the stroke. And uh, he had so many sentences. One of the sentences that I like very much to hear, a very short one, but he said, Israel has the capability to defend itself, but he always added, by itself. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we are not an isolated, we have support, strategic support from the state, and, and it's super, super important strategically, and of course, practically, but ev eventually, Israel has to know how to defend itself by itself. Okay. By the way, a moment of digression, Israel. You knew Ariel Sharon pretty well. What was he like? He taught me what it means a political leader. He taught me what it means to be on the top with, with actually the slogan, the buck stops here. This, it's not a slogan. He taught me what it means that you have to take decisions that are not popular, not popular to what the people want, but actually what are the decisions that you think it's right, even though they're not popular. And you will have to sacrifice some of your interest, personal one or image one, but if they are correct, you have to take those decisions. He was a true leader with all the background, by the way, that prepared him when he was a soldier and then a minister uh, in, in so many ministries, but he was prepared for this role. He was a very warm-hearted, humoristic, cynical type of guy, amazing humor. He had um, a full understanding about his role 
not only as the Prime Minister of Israel, but as the one that is responsible for the continuity and the security of the Jewish people. You know, every meeting, and I, I, I participate in, participated in hundreds or thousands of meetings with him. When, when, whether it was George W. Bush, whether it was a meeting with Bill Gates, whether it was a meeting with European leaders or business leaders, the first sentence he said to them was, first of all, I'm a Jew, and this is the most important thing to me. This was the first sentence in every meeting. First of all, I am a Jew, and this is the most important thing to me. Now, you know, when you are working next to our prime minister, we become, we, we are making jokes of, of all kinds of slogans that he used. But it took me a while to, to uh, but he said, he didn't define himself as, a, first of all, I'm a human being. He didn't define himself, first of all, I'm a military person. He didn't say I'm a political leader. First of all, I'm a Jew. And this is the most important thing for me. And understanding where it comes from gave me the understanding of what he see as his role. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times a prime minister dedicate time of his agenda on conversion? The issue of conversion, that it's so in argument around the Jewish people. Spend time about how Giyu, how uh, uh, spoke with uh, rabbis, spoke with other scholars, how I can make it simpler. So he had the feeling of connected so much to his Jewish identity that he designated much of his time, not only to security, economy, and stuff like that, but also to this kind of issues. That is wonderful to hear, and there's so much misconception or misunderstanding of Ariel Sharon. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I want to talk about Israel bonds for one moment, and my understanding is that in this period of time, Israel bonds really was able to raise what I'm told is a great deal of money, and we're talking about over a billion dollars. First of all, is that true? And if it is, why do you think it happened? First of all, it's, it's very much true. Um, maybe I'll open it for a second. Um, like any government, like any state that is facing this coronavirus crisis, governments are now having huge, huge costs, additional of costs. Of course. Now they have to pay to the health costs, they have to pay unemployment um, uh, benefits. They have to pay to support uh, businesses and so on. So from the one hand, the cost of the government is going up. The other hand, no income. Yeah. So the income of the government is getting down. It means that the, the de deficit is getting bigger. A responsible government, and this is, I have to Israel, is securing now, when we are beginning, when the states are not still in dire straits economically, this is the time to secure additional funding, additional capital. And Israel is doing it through internal resources in Israel, but also through outside resources. And Israel bonds is one of the most important vehicles that secures funds for the state of Israel, secures capital from the state of Israel from 1951. And uh, you might ask, after Israel is so successfully economically and how Israel is so uh, established and the infrastructure is amazing and the high-tech sector is great, still we need Israel bonds. So first of all, yes, we're still developing our country and we want to be on the, um, mo the, the, the number one places in everything. But we said all the time that we have an amazing resource, which is, which is the Jewish world. The Jewish world, as we started this conversation, loves Israel and supports it without condition. Absolutely. And through the years, we saw 
that in times of crisis, wars in Israel or other cases, Israel received donations or Israel were managed to raise more capital through Israel bonds through this from 1951. So a responsible government now is working with us in order to secure additional funding in order to face any eventuality in any scenario. And this is what we're trying to do this time. So if every year we are selling $1 billion of Israel bonds, this year we will try to sell $1.5 billion again to secure funding for the state of Israel. And thank God we have this amazing Jewish world and other Israel supporters. I will let the audience know, by the way, states in the United States are buying Israel bonds. It's a tradition. Massachusetts, you know, states that doesn't have a big Jewish population, still, they are buying through their pension funds or they are buying directly through all kinds of endowments that the states are having, but states are buying Israel bonds in order to show their support. And thank God they are keep on doing it. Ohio and New York are holding Israel bonds more than any other state. Just as a, just as a, is an example, but thank God we are using now this safety net of the great Jews of the United States and the other places around the world to the security of Israel. A, that's wonderful. B, call a vote to you personally as the head of Israel Bonds right now. You know, when I was much younger, Israel Bonds were given to kids as they became bar mitzvah. And for a long time, Israel bonds were something that was just part of what American Jewish life was. It's not so much true now. And so I want to know the extent to which if JBS viewers are watching you right now and they want to do something in addition to helping all the other things they're helping, including we have problems here in America and many of our viewers help support JBS, but what if they wanted to help Israel through Israel bonds? Is this something they can do? First of all, it still, it still is. Uh, and thank God Israel is less in need like in the 50s and 60s and our economy is booming. So it's true that we, we need less the funding in those years, in, in the last, I would say, 20 years. But still Israel bonds is having those gifts of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. But I will tell you a great option. Some of your audience, some of you are considering to give donation to the synagogue or to a charity, to Magen David or to FIDF uh, or your federation. Do it, but do it as buying Israel bonds. Let's say you want to contribute $25,000 for Magen David or for your synagogue because you know that they need it buy Israel bonds and give it as a gift. So you do double mitzvah. One, you help the charity that is close to your heart. And second, you bought Israel bonds. So you do a double mitzvah and this is one of the options. Go to our website, israelbonds.com and you have all the options. Thank God we are open. Our employees are working. They are working remotely. By the way, important to say, we are employing employing 200 210 employees. We didn't send even one home to vacation without paying. Everyone is working, even admins that not necessarily has to have to, has the same contribution. We are paying as scheduled salaries and people are working, waking up in the morning with a mission, with a cause, and what greater cause than to secure the future of Israel. Israel Maimon, you are out of this world. It's it has been such a joy meeting you, even though we had to meet on Zoom. There are so many more questions I have for you. I hope you will let me get back to you to arrange a second time that we can talk like this. In the meantime, to you in every way, personally, for your children in Israel, for your family as a whole. You should be safe, you should be well, and you should have koach to go forward and continue to contribute to the State of Israel as you have for decades. It's been a real honor meeting you. I'm just, you, you must promise me there will be a second time.
Mark, first of all, it was a joyable hour. I didn't feel that it, it was an hour. It felt so short. Thank you. It was remarkable. It was really a great conversation that we are sitting like one next to the other and just having a conversation over coffee. I promise you, I have so many other stories that, you know, pops in my head through the, I promise I'll be back. Thank you, my dear friend. We'll talk soon. You be well. And that was my conversation with Israel Maimon, a very special human being who can teach us a great deal about issues confronting the state of Israel. And I hope to have other opportunities to share Israel's perspective with you on upcoming editions of L'Chaim. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed by Israel Maimon. Please email me at rabbigolub at jbstv.org. RabbiGolub at jbstv.org. I love hearing from you. Also remember, you can now listen to L'Chaim as a podcast. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life and stay well. Lachaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.